Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Valley Booksellers Totally Criminal Cocktail Hour with mystery novelist William Kent Kruger and his newest novel, Lightning Strike. Carol, please turn off your camera. <laughs> We've got people clicking in. While you're tuning in, please let us know where you're Zooming from, what city or state you might be in. There we go. We've got 77 people checked in. Oh, my next door neighbor must be up at her cabin because she's in Cross Lake now. <laughs> my mom's here tonight, Kent. Oh, good. <laughs> We've got Wisconsin and Minnesota well represented. Megan Gunner is with us tonight, my boss for many, many years. That's great. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. We're expecting a very large audience this evening. Cleveland, Ohio, Illinois. Oh, this is terrific. Yes, that's great. Well, I'm sure many of you either went into the store and picked up your copy of Lightning Strike because there are signed first editions there, or you may have ordered it online. I will put a link right here in the chat box. If you haven't already ordered it, you can either order it online this evening, just copy and paste that into your browser, or you can pop into the store at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and get a copy and see what else our wonderful staff at Valley Bookseller is recommending. So. Um, Carol, we need you to keep your camera off, please. Thank you. <laughs> there we but go. It's always, always a pleasure to see Carol. I know, all these technical issues. Anyway, we've got an audience of 83 so far, and I'm sure there'll be more checking in. If you did miss um, the event tonight, or if you have friends who want to watch it, it's being recorded, and that will be available for viewing tomorrow on YouTube. So don't worry, you will have a chance to hear Kent and all of his wisdom, no matter if you're live or waiting until later in the week. But welcome, as I said, to this very special Zoom edition of the Totally Criminal Cocktail Hour. I know you're used to meeting live at a fun restaurant in Stillwater, but since that's not possible right now with COVID, we are so thrilled that Kent's able to join us virtually. I'm Pamela Klingerhorn. Many of you will recognize me from the Literature Lovers Night Out program. And tonight I'm really thrilled to be working with the Totally Criminal Cocktail Group. So thank you for having me and thank you to Valley Bookseller for hosting this event. Um, thanks to all of you for tuning in from all over the Midwest. It looks like we're well represented. Kent will be taking questions tonight. And if you have any questions for him, please put them in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a series of icons, it's to the far right. And I will be monitoring those throughout the program and we will get all the questions answered. Minnesota, as you know, is home to very many wonderful authors, but William Kent Kruger is one of our most beloved. He's not only a beautiful writer and a charming man, he's also a great humanitarian and often uses his literary events to support Native American communities and charities. Kent is also one of the biggest award winners in the state. He has over 21 awards to his name, most notably the Minnesota Book Award and the prestigious Edgar Award, the holy grail of mystery writers. In 2016, Kent won all four major mystery awards. His last nine novels have all been New York Times bestsellers. And you may have seen Kent just this Sunday in the New York Times book review. I went ahead because he got the full color treatment. I blew it up so everybody could see. And I will post that article in the chat box as well, because that was wonderful to see you there. Congratulations, Kent. How exciting was that? That was pretty exciting, I have to admit. <laughs> Very fun and full color even. So if you are the first time reader of Kent's work, and this is your introduction to the Quirk O'Connor mystery series, you are in for a treat. Kent is going to tell us all about Lightning Strike, which is a prequel to the Quirk O'Connor series. We can't safely be together, but Kent did come to Valley Bookseller and signed an enormous quantity of first editions. And those are still available, whether you order online tonight or pop into the store tomorrow. And if we run out, Kent has graciously agreed to sign some more. So we will make sure we get those, whether you want one for yourself or gifts 
they make a wonderful, very special gift to have a signed first edition of a novel. So without further ado, let's all put our hands together in the comfort of our own homes and give William Kent Kruger a big round of applause at our virtual stage tonight. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Kent. It's so great to have you. Oh, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Pamela. And I have to say, um, the Totally Criminal Cocktail Hour, which is what we would be doing had uh, the, the uh, Delta variant not inter interfered with our plans, um, is always one of my most favorite events whenever I do a book tour. I love the Totally Criminal Cocktail Hour. Well, what's not to love about happy hour and books? And it's just a wonderful thing to all get together and enjoy that together. But my first question for you tonight about Lightning Strike is, what was the catalyst after 20 Cork O'Connor mystery novels to finally take on a prequel? You know, it was actually done at the, uh, almost the insistence of my agent. For years, she has been after me to write a prequel to the series because uh, across the course of the uh, 17 books that precede this one, I have often made reference to events in Cork O'Connor's early life that had a significant impact on his um, on who he is as an adult, and uh, and she thought she kept telling me you need to explore these relationships, these events, much uh, much more deeply. And you know, finally it was sort of like, well, I don't have another idea. Let's give that one a shot. And I'm so glad I did. I so enjoyed writing this story. And I enjoyed reading it. I think you have a real gift for writing about children. I know in this tender land and. Um, Ordinary Grace, your ch children characters are just wonderful, as is young Cork in here. Well, two reasons for that. One is that, you know, I am a father. I raised children of my own. I was also a child myself, and I remember <laughs> that, that time very well. And uh, uh, Megan um, Gunner is with us this evening, uh, who was my boss at the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota. And from Megan, I learned a great deal about uh, child development, about children, about the resilience. And uh, that is uh, an important part of what I, I try to fold in my work. But uh, for those of you who aren't aware of um, uh, uh, what's going on with Lightning Strike, it is a story set um, in the past. It takes place when Cork is 12 years old. Uh, and it, it takes place in the summer before his father is killed in the line of duty. I'm not giving anything away there in the opening. We know that his father was killed in the line of duty. Um, but for any of you who know my body of work, you know that both Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land are narrated by 12, 13-year-old protagonists. So I'm really comfortable getting into the mindset of, a, of an adolescent male. I've said this often and I'll say it again. Uh, I really believe that men don't mature much past their 12th or 13th year. We're always stuck in our adolescence. And so it's easy for me to capture that voice. Well, I think you did it very successfully in Lightning Strike again. I really enjoyed spending time with you. Thank Cork. you. Um, if a reader is new to the series, is Lightning Strike the way, way that you recommend entering the series or should they go back to Iron Lake and move forward? I think this is an excellent introduction to the series because you, you need to know absolutely nothing uh, about any of the characters, any of the elements in a Cork O'Connor novel in order to enjoy Lightning Strike. And it will be a good introduction to all of the characters, all of the elements that you will find in a typical Cork O'Connor novel. Um, what my hope is, is that, because it can be a daunting thing for a reader to look at um, a, a series like mine, a very long running series like mine and say, oh my God, 17, 18 books in that series, ah. But if you begin with something like Lightning Strike where you don't need to know any of the history and you like it, then it's a really good way to uh, segue into the, the series as a whole. And if you do that, then I recommend that you begin with the first in the series, Iron Lake, and move forward uh, sequentially because the 17 books in the series before Lightning Strike span 15 years in the lives of the characters involved. So if you begin with Iron Lake and you read in order, what you're going to see is the gradual progression and aging of all of the characters, how their relationships change, how their perceptions of themselves and each other and the relationship to the world changes. And it's just a much richer experience if you do it that way. Another thing I love about your books is that they're so accessible for older teen readers as well as adults. I know you and I are, were doing an event together a couple of years ago 
and a, hist or a high school teacher brought a whole group of students because they had done Iron Lake as one of their classroom reads. I think that's just so wonderful. And I know the kids were just had their socks knocked off actually getting to meet you. <laughs> well, I'm, I am gratified that many of my novels appear on recommended reading lists for high school students. Um, I always set out to write a story that would appeal across all age groups. Um, and uh, and that is, is exactly how it has turned out. I'm just so pleased to see that. And, and I get lots of I get lots of uh, I get lots of uh, notes uh, uh, from uh, teachers uh, telling me that they're teaching either a Cork O'Connor novel because of its connection to the Ojibwe community, or Ordinary Grace or This Tender Land simply simply because they're really fine books. <laughs> they are. I have to agree with that. I can't tell you how many times I have given them as gifts. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Pamela. Oh, oh, absolutely. A wonderful, wonderful gift to receive or gift. So uh, your character, Cork O'Connor, is of mixed heritage, as you mentioned, and your novels often involve the social issues that surround the conflict between the native and the white populations in their towns, um, as well as the inner conflict that Cork feels himself between those two traditions. Um, would you talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. You know, one of the reasons, um, so when you're a writer of fiction, one of the things that you're looking for is conflict because it's conflict that drives great stories. What is it that drives uh, Romeo and Juliet? It's the conflict between those two powerful families, the Montagues and the Capulets, in which our star-crossed lovers find themselves caught. Uh, Moby Dick, you know, Ahab and that white whale, conflict, conflict, conflict. When I looked up north, when I was searching for what I wanted to write, um, and, uh, and I looked up in northern Minnesota, all I saw was conflict up there. So conflict in that really rugged landscape that we have in the North Country, conflict in you know, the weather that we all are very familiar with, and conflict in the cultures that are trying to live up there uh, together as amicably as they can, and often not doing a very good job of that. Um, so I, um, I have essentially used the Cork O'Connor series as a platform to explore conflict in cultures. Uh, conflict in pers perspectives and perceptions, uh, conflict in beliefs, um, because we all need to understand. And, and one of the things that I was is, is trying to do with Lightning Strike was to point out to the reader that a, an event, the truth of an event can be different for you, depending upon the perspective from which you view it. And so in Lightning Strike, the death of the elder um, is one that is viewed by the white populace of Tamarack County in one way and viewed by the native population in Tamarack County in another way. And so I wanted to talk about how we see truths in different ways um, and how difficult it is really ultimately to get to the truth. Because of the conflict, because of all of the, the misconceptions and all of the uh, misunderstandings that those conflicts create. That is so true, yes. And I think that you did it particularly well in the character of Cork because he walks on both sides of that path. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, his child interpreting adult events. Yeah, in Lightning Strike, this is the first time he is really beginning to become aware that he's different, mm -hmm. uh, that he's really different from both the Ojibwe in Tamarack County and the white populace in Tamarack County. And he's aware that people talk about him differently on both sides, uh, both of those cultures because of that. He's beginning to become aware that people in, in uh, the, the white people in Tamarack County in Aurora, Minnesota, um, use terms that are not particularly um, complimentary when they talk about him and his family. And he's aware, becoming more and more aware that uh, the Ojibwe on the Iron Lake Reservation view him and his family differently as well because of the mixture in that marriage there. Cork's mother is half Ojibwe. His grandmother is full, this true blood Iron Lake Ojibwe, but his father is Irish. Yes, and his father is a very complicated man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, as, as are all fathers. As is everyone, right? <laughs> Cork's father, Liam, my grandson's name, so I have a very great fondness for that name. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> he is a very strong role model for young Cork as he comes of age. 
Now, you have the hindsight of having written and been crafting this character for so many years and, you know, as an adult, and now you're looking back. So how is older Quirk's character either very much like or unlike his father in the way that he's been formed through these important life lessons that he's imparted as a young man? Well, he's very like his father in many ways. He's very like his father in his approach to trying to get to the truth of things um, because he approaches it with a fairly logical mind. His father is a, man, is a trained cop. Um, and as a cop, he believes that it's the evidence that you follow. Um, you don't let your prejudices, you, as much as you can, you don't let your prejudices or preconceived notions um, or any of the other goofy things that are out there floating around guide you. You're guided by the, the evidence before you. Um, Cork, as a young man, is beginning to understand that there are ways of perceiving the world that have nothing to do with concrete evidence. And, um, and as he grows and uh, becomes center stage for the Cork O'Connor series, we see him as a man who has embraced that there are other ways of viewing existence uh, than the way white people view existence, and that's the influence of his Ojibwe heritage. So um, he, he is his own man, certainly, when he grows up, but he is an amalgam of what his father has taught him and also what his Ojibwe ancestors have uh, shown him. Do you think he's learned from his father's mistakes as a sheriff? Now, do any of us learn from our parents' mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> I think not. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think Cork makes his own mistakes. Um, As do we all. But at, at very much at the heart of Cork is his desire to seek justice and to treat all people fairly. And I think that was very much a value that his father had as well. As we said, this is very much at heart a father-son novel, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about the women of Lightning Strike, Cork's mother, Colleen, his grandmother, Dilsey. I mean, they're products of their time, they're homemakers, but at the same time, they have a lot simmering below that surface. These are women with a rich intellectual life, and yet they carry a lot of grief, whether it's Colleen's losses of her infants, um, Dilsey's loss of her people and land. Um, are these characters developed more in your other novels? Will we see more about them later? What's the background on them? Well, I've often made reference to both Colleen Cork's mother and uh, Grandma Dilsey, his grandmother. Um, and I have never had the opportunity to explore them as deeply as I've explored their characters in Lightning Strike. And I found them to be, just be fascinating, very strong women, uh, intelligent, as you say. And, um, Grandma Dilsey, of course, represents very much the Ojibwe perspective that um, you know the white people have not been a very, very good influence uh, since they came into this uh, nation. Um, they have lied and cheated and stolen, and she has not a lot of good things to say about white people in general. Um, and uh, and Colleen, her daughter, who um, who married, uh, well, Grandma Dilsey married an Irishman. And so she began this process of moving strictly outside the bounds of her tribal culture. So she is, uh, it takes flack for, for that from the community. Her daughter, who is half Ojibwe, um, sees the world in, in, in that split way that Cork will also see the world. She has a foot in two different traditions, her Ojibwe tradition and her Irish tradition. Um, and so she is struggling as well. Um, and, and if you look at the story, she is the one who's trying to bridge the gap between Liam, who sees the world in one concrete way, and Grandma Dilsey, who sees the world in another concrete way. And so she's trying to bring those two worlds together in a way that will hold the family together. Because one of the, one of the questions Cork asks as a kid in all of this, is this going to, is this going to break our family up? Is, is everything is changing. Is that one of the things that will change, um, you know, with the speed of a lightning strike as well? But the, but they are they are I think very strong characters. I worked hard to make them very strong characters. Very important in the story. Very important to Cork in his development. Oh, that really comes through. Um, yeah, I could 
just tell they are the backbone of this family. I mean, Colleen demonstrates a great love for both her mother and her relatives in the um, reservation, as well as, of course, wanting to honor and respect her husband, whom she loves deeply, and raise her son in a way that honors both traditions. And yeah, you walk that fine line very beautifully. So. Thank you. Yes, we're getting a couple of questions from the audience about um, some of the native aspects of the book. It says, how do you interweave um, respect for the, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Shanab and their culture into your books? Do you know, I, whenever I write a, a story in the Coco Connor series, I am painfully aware that I'm a white guy trespassing on a culture not my own. I have no native heritage in me whatsoever that I'm aware of. Um, and so I work very hard to represent the culture respectfully. Um, and the, the response from the native readers who have bothered to, to contact me has been uh, quite positive. Um, to a person, they have complimented me on the respectful way in which I deal with their culture. Um, I work very hard to get it right. I have friends in the Ojibwe culture, in the, you know, the Ojibwe community. And whenever I have a, whenever my deadlines will allow, I have at least one of my Ojibwe friends read and vet the manuscript. So I haven't said anything that's too, that's too stupid or even worse, oh, offensive. Um, and what I try to do is weave the cultural elements naturally into the story so that I'm, I hope I'm never, you know, hitting the reader over the head with all of the information about the, the Ojibwe culture that I try to include. Um, I try to make it seem like a very natural thing that Cork thinks about his Ojibwe heritage or that the Ojibwe characters in the story, the Anishinaabe characters in the story offer Cork perspectives from their own culture. I, 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 you know, I take great pains to try to do that in a very uh, organic way. That's how I felt when I was reading. I never felt like it was you know, overly didactic. I was just absorbing Good. this information about the characters because it was important to have that in the story, but it wasn't a separate lesson in itself. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that, Pamela. Thank you. We have another question. Um, someone is wanting to know um, what kind of reaction or discussions has there been from Native Americans who might have read the book? I haven't heard anybody, any reaction um, from anyone who, uh, a Native reader yet, who has read Lightning Strike. Uh, I have a good friend, Monty uh, Frank, who is a uh, an officer with the Malax Band of Ojibwe Tribal Police Force, and Monty helped me. In fact, it was Monty really who gave me the idea, essentially, for Lightning Strike. He, I had, I had no idea about the Relocation Act of 1956, mm -hmm. and Monty talked to me about it, uh, and it's the terrible effect that it had on Native communities across the country. Um, and so I had, I asked Monty to read the manuscript. His, his only response was he thought I should have made more of the uh, Relocation Act of 1956 and its devastating effect, which, which may have been true. But, of but again, I wanted to re weave that naturally, organically into the story and not hit the reader over the head with it. Um, but I haven't, yet, yet, I haven't yet heard uh, significantly from the Native community on lightning strike in particular. It's just out, you know, it's only a week out. I know, exactly, <laughs> give it some time. Um, if readers are wanting to do more extensive research into the Native American Relocation Act, uh, where do you recommend that they go to do that? Well, I have information on my website, but you know, information is actually out there easily accessible. I hate to say this, but I think you can start by Googling the Rel Relocation Act of 1956, uh -huh. and you find lots of information, lots of articles uh, discussing um, the, uh, the lack of wisdom in that particular uh, act of Congress mm -hmm. and the, the terrible effects that it had on the Native communities here in the United States. And your book is particularly timely as Big John kept running away from the boarding schools. And of course, the horrific events of the boarding schools have been in the papers constantly with these unknown cemeteries that keep coming to light right now. So yeah, the residential schools in Canada were the first really for the story to break. Um, it's just tragic news coming out of, out of uh, Canada. But uh, since our Secretary of the Interior, Deb Helland, has um, requested an investigation into the Native American boarding schools here, I think we are going to see more and more and more 
reports of the travesties that occurred uh, on the Native American boarding schools here. And Megan has just put a link in the chat box um, from the archives if people want to read more about Indian relocation. So, and I, I did want to point out, I had said that the mother and grandmother were homemakers, but um, Robin very kindly corrected me and reminded me that they are both teachers. As They're well. both teachers. Dilsey so. was a te very, teacher very early on the Iron Lake Reservation and her daughter Colleen is also a teacher. Right, so these are well-educated women, so. Um, Henry Malou, one of our viewers is asking about him. Um, she said she found his words reassuring and wise. How did you develop his character? And would you ever consider writing a novel from his perspective? Oh, Henry Malou, don't we all love Henry Malou? He's probably the favorite character for every reader. He's certainly my favorite character to write. Um, I always look forward to writing those scenes in which Malou is going to play a part because I almost never have to rewrite those scenes for whatever reason they come to me. And, uh, and he says exactly what he ought to say. God only knows where that comes from. You know, every story you tell you, you talk to is going to talk about the magic of storytelling. The fact that there's a great deal of what we do that simply comes to us as blessings. Um, and Malou is one of those blessings that came to me. I don't know Malou. I've never known a Malou. I know he exists because I have had a lot of my uh, native readers say, oh, that's our elder so-and-so. So I know he's out there. Um, but he just came to me sort of full blown and, uh, and kind of took over the stories. I, I cannot imagine writing a story in the Cork O'Connor series now without Henry Malou in one way or another at the heart of it. I just love that guy. Would he ever be your main narrator? I don't, I don't, you know, I try not to make my native characters narrators. For me, that, that's, that is the trespass. I would find it difficult to write entirely inside a native perspective and, and believe that I'm getting it right. So I will never write a story from Henry Malou's perspective as such. And it's really much more effective, I think, for Malou to be out there and for characters to, you know, the things radiate from Malou and for the characters to have to absorb that and understand the truths that, that Malou is offering them because it's not always an easy thing to do. And I so like that set up much more than, you know, seeing from the inside where these things come uh, from in Malou. Now, back when you started writing this series, what was the first year that Iron Lake came out? It came out in 1998. 1998. Okay, well, back then, we did not have the wealth of American, Native American writers that we have now. You know, now Louise Erdrich, Tommy Orange, Linda Lagarde Grover, David Troyer, they're, they're household names. Um, and so people are able to read their own voices. Um, has this changed your writing at all about Native American characters since you started? Oh, only my fear that I'm not doing it well. <laughs> And but you know what I try to read by your readers. <laughs> what I try to tell readers is um, you are you are reading about the Ojibwe culture from a white perspective. Mm -hmm. If you really want to know the Ojibwe culture, read Louis Erdrich, mm -hmm. read David or Anton Troyer. Um, you know these are people who are in fact Ojibwe, have grown up with a, um, a great connection to the culture of their birth, and these are the people who can really tell you what it's like to be Ojibwe. If you want to know, if you want to read a great Ojibwe storyteller, pick up a book by uh, Jim Northrup. Um, he passed away a few years ago, but he was a wonderful Ojibwe storyteller. Yes, and Cork provides a different perspective, particularly because he is half Irish American and half Native American. So, and he's yeah, when I'm, when I'm writing Cork, <laughs> Cork O'Connor is in fact three quarters Irish and only a quarter Ojibwe. Um, so there's a lot of the white perspective in him. So it's easier for me to write uh, Cork than it is for me to think about writing inside the native perspective. And of course, Minnesota and the Northern Territories up there, they are a character in themselves. Do you want to talk about a little bit about that, setting your books up there and where you go for inspiration? Sure. So I'm not native to Minnesota. I didn't move here until I was about 30 years old. So my wife could go to the University of Minnesota Law School. And before that, I was a gypsy kid. I lived all over the place. I, I never really had anywhere that I thought of or called home 
But I swear to you, the minute we set foot in Minnesota, I knew I'd found home. I fell in love with this place. So I always knew that uh, that when I got really serious about my writing, it was going to be in some way, shape, or form a homage to this adopted home of mine. Now, after we moved here in the summer, we began doing what everybody in the Twin Cities does in the summer. We began vacationing up north. We began spending a portion of every summer at a YMCA camp north of Ely, a place called Camp du Nord, which is literally across the road from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And when I discovered that remarkable territory, I knew this is what I want to write about. Um, so I began spending as much time as I could up in the North Country, just getting to know it well. And when I began to create, um, for example, when I created Aurora, my fictional uh, town where Cork O'Connor was, um, was sheriff for a while and where he resides on Gooseberry Lane, um, I wanted to create a town that, although there is a real Aurora, Minnesota, you know, anybody who knows the Arrowhead of Minnesota knows there's a real Aurora, Minnesota. That's not my Aurora, Minnesota. Um, I have created a town that is an amalgam of so many of the elements of the Northwood towns that I have come to know and love, because I wanted a place that readers could say, who know the North Country could say, oh, this is, this is a Northwoods town, but they couldn't say, oh, it's Ely, or oh, it's Virginia, or oh, it's Babbitt, you know? I wanted to, to have the geographic freedom uh, to do what I needed to do for the stories. So I, I continued uh, to make my pilgrimages to the North Country, particularly in the season in which I know a Coco Connor novel is going to be set, because I want to be up there in that season to know, you know, what are the colors like in the forests? Uh, what are the smells like? What are people wearing? What are people talking about? So that anybody who knows the North Country well will say, oh yeah, this feels right, you know? We have a question from the audience about Cork's friends, Jorge and Billy. And that whole friendship, it was very authentic. I remember, remember whether you're a boy or a girl, those childhood friendships and their intensity. And this uh, uh, guest is wondering if they were actually inspired by anyone. Uh, well, Jorge, certainly. He was uh, probably my best friend for many, many, many years. Um, his name was George. For whatever reason, I always called him Jorge. He was uh, just a gifted artist. Uh, we both loved monster magazines <laughs> and comic books. And so Jorge was certainly inspired by, by my friend George. Billy Downwind uh, was a creation uh, that I needed to use in order to get into the um, the whole question of the, the importance and the effect of the Relocation Act. But it's really easy for me to create those, those, relate, those adolescent male relationships that you know every guy knows when he's 12 or 13 years old. If you've ever seen the movie Stand By Me, I love the, I love the last line of the movie. It's not the last line of the, uh, of the novella that Stephen King wrote, but it's the last line of the, of the movie. And it goes something like this. Uh, I've never had better friends than I had when I was 12 years old. Jesus, does anybody? <laughs> I love that line. That's a wonderful, wonderful line. <laughs> yes, and I believe, is the short story, is that called The Body? Is that correct? Yeah, oh, very good. Yeah, it's The Body. It's, it is one of the best evocations of adolescent male relationships that I have ever read. I agree. And it's got a fabulous story within a story. Do you remember the story of Lard Ass Hogan? I do indeed, <laughs> which was which was wonderfully portrayed on the screen. I have to say, if you have a strong stomach, <laughs> if you have a strong stomach, yeah, it's 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 every adolescent male's uh, dream, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For those of you who want to order a copy and check it out yourself, I believe it's the Four Seasons is the name of the collection that it's in. You know, I can't remember the collection. I just remember that yeah. that terrific novella. Once again, we'll send you to Google, but you can get definitely get a copy at Valley Bookseller. <laughs> 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 and let's see we have a question about how covid may have changed your writing process do you still go to bookshops or coffee shops to write do you know for more than 40 years i did all of my creative writing in coffee shops uh, it was part of the magic of the process but once the coronavirus made us uh shelter in, in place i exchanged the coffee shop for my kitchen counter um, so for those of you who don't know my process, I have always uh, risen at six o'clock or a little before usually in the morning, got myself dressed and have gone to a coffee shop where I spend the first two or even three hours of the day writing. Um, 
but with the coronavirus, I had to stay home. Um, and my, my wife, who is the most wonderful woman in the world, promised to stay in bed every morning until I was finished with my writing. <laughs> what a sacrifice. Um, and what I've discovered is that, um, you know, when you have contractual obligations to meet, you find a way to meet those obligations, uh, whatever the circumstances. So I have discovered that I can, in fact, write at home. It's not the most comfortable experience for me. I still prefer coffee shops, but I've been able to get the job done. In fact, during the pandemic, I found myself in an incredibly creative period. I wrote three novellas. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Um, I wrote the next book in the Cork O'Connor series, which will be out uh, next fall. And I began work on the next standalone novel as well. So very creative period. And I think it was because in a typical year, uh, I'm doing events all over the country promoting. Um, but with the coronavirus, I just stayed home and was able just to focus essentially on my writing. That said, I did, uh, let's say I have Zoomed since uh, the pandemic set in with over 300 book groups across the country. So I've, been, I've still been busy um, connecting with readers as much as I can. If other book clubs are interested in connecting with you over Zoom, is that information also on your website? Sure, there is in fact a link to, to contact me if you would like to set up a Zoom meeting with your book group. Okay. And you mentioned contracts and someone in the audience, actually my next door neighbor, is wondering if you have signed any contracts for um, movies or series for any of your books. Ordinary Grace uh, is currently under contract. A screenplay is being written for it. It is being designed as a multi-episode uh, series for one of the streaming platforms. Um, I haven't seen the final, uh, the final script yet, uh, but I'm really excited about that. The people who are handling it are just terrific folks. We have been in discussion with so far three different production companies for the rights to this tender land. Um, I'm going to be on a Zoom call next week with uh, yet another director who, who I will, who shall remain nameless at this point. Um, who is, in fact, he, he's in contacting me and my agents, he said, I have been looking for another Stand By Me movie um, uh, prospect. And this tender land is my Stand By Me. So when he said that, I thought, okay, I, li I like you already. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> so that's out there. And I have continued to meet with a couple of producers who are very interested in turning the Cork O'Connor series into a television series. But, you know, don't don't hold your breath. We'll see what happens. Oh, well, that's all exciting news on the horizon. Do you have any experience yourself in writing screenplays or will that be somebody else who takes on that work? Yeah, I have no desire to write the screenplays. I would love to be in the um, in the writer's room when the scripts are being discussed uh, because I'd love to be able to offer my perspective. Um, whether they'll listen to me or not is an, is an entirely different thing. Really, in Hollywood, the writer is the writer of the uh, of the novel is the lowest guy on the totem pole. I've heard from other authors that that can go very different ways. <laughs> they really yeah, you know, or they lock you out. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. Uh, I'm not like eager to get my work onto the big screen because I have so many colleagues whose work has been translated to the big screen and it's been a disaster. Uh, so what's more important to me than getting it on the screen is having it done right, having the right people do it. So that's, that's what I'm concerned about and that's what I'm trying to get to, the right people to do this work. That's great because your readers want to see yeah, the characters yeah. done right, the way that they've envisioned them all these years. Exactly. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box and we will get to them. Uh, Carl is wondering, you talk about your development of the story comes from interviews with the important characters. Can you talk a bit about how your almost unique character development works? It's organic. <laughs> I, um, I have an idea about the part a character is going to play in a story. And then I begin to write the story. And as the character is in um, dialogue with or relationship with other characters who I know better, for example, Cork O'Connor, I begin to discover who that character is. And very often I discover that character not by what they're saying, but what they're not saying to Cork. Um, and I know a, a, other writers use this technique. You, you, I'm grounded in my Cork O'Connor character. I've been writing him for so long. So how other characters respond to him 
or what their motives are in, re, in interacting with them tells me a lot about those characters. Most of, my, most of the characters in my novels are oh, kind of Frankenstein creations. Um, after, you know, I'm 70 years old and after 70 years of living, I have a pretty good grasp of human nature. I have seen so many people. And so I take that understanding of human nature and, um, and use it to dissect people and pull from them what I need in order to create a character who will do the things I need that character to do. Uh, I know you, you got a question earlier. I think it was from Megan Gunner, in fact, about the characters that I put in my, my stories. Are they real characters? Um, are, are there anything, is there anything real about these people that inspires the story itself? And I think M Megan was actually asking a, specifically about a character in, uh, in Lightning Strike. There was a character in Lightning Strike named Sandy Heron, who owns the bookstore in town called uh, A Novel Idea. So this is, Sandy's real, and A Novel Idea is real. And this is why. When you are a writer and you attend conferences, very often in those conferences, there is an auction held to raise money for a charitable literary cause. And one of the prize offerings at the auction is to be a character in a writer's novel. And so at Baushikan, a couple, Baushikan the International Mystery Convention um, that was held in um, Fort Lauderdale that year, I, I put up a character for an auction item. Sandy Heron, who is uh, a bookseller, uh, won the character. And so I made Sandy Heron a character in this novel, and I made her store a novel idea, her bookstore. And I just, I loved doing that. So I got to tell you, Pamela, there are several other characters in this story who are, um, who are auction item characters. And uh, whenever I have a character, whenever someone wins the auction, I give them the choice. Do you want to be a good person or do you want to be a bad person? <laughs> Guess what everybody wants to be? Most people want to be a bad person in your book. <laughs> At least in the pages of the novel, they want to be bad. Sandy wanted to be good, so I was able, I'm really happy, I was able to make her a really fine person. But there are some bad people in this story that wanted to be there and be bad. Oh. Are there any online auctions available if anyone watching tonight wants to try and win and have their name in one of your next books? No, there's nothing going on at the moment. Okay. <laughs> um, I very often, our local library system, the Ramsey County Library System, uh, when they hold their fundraisers, I have often given them a character uh, as an auction item. Very fun. But, yeah, but, but nothing's out there at the moment. Okay. All right. Well, you can put that on your website too next time it comes up. I'm sure you'll have a lot of interest. <laughs> I'm wondering about Cork. Now, many years ago when you, when you first started to this, did he come to you fully formed and had the story he needed you to tell? Or how did he work with you when you got started? Honest to God, here's the seed. I kid you not. Here's the seed of Cork O'Connor. Long before I knew I was going to write a Cork O'Connor story, had any idea what I was going to write, I had in mind a character that I, I thought I could write about. And all I knew about him at that point, that very early point, was this. He was going to be the kind of guy who was so resilient that no matter how far life pushed him down, he would always bob back to the surface and his name was going to be Quark. Honest to God. You know, I told that to an audience not too long ago and some smart ass in the audience said, why didn't you just call him Bob? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the beginning for Quark. Then when I decided I was going to write stories set in the North Country, and uh, began looking at the whole issue of conflict in the North Country being between the cultures up there. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to create a character who, in who he is, will mirror the conflict of those two cultures, why don't you, boy? So I decided I was going to make this, this guy, this cork, a man of mixed heritage. Um, so I knew he was going to be Ojibwe. Then the question was, what was his Euro ancestry going to be? And you know, in the North Country, if you're a mixed heritage, you could be Ojibwe Finn, Ojibwe Swede, Ojibwe Slav, Ojibwe Italian, Ojibwe German, Ojibwe Russian, you name it. But for a variety of reasons, I decided I was going to make Cork Ojibwe and Irish. And Cork became very naturally then Corcoran O'Connor. That was the evolution of Cork. I made him a family man because I'm a family man. Um, there you go. There you go. 
you go. And it worked so well. <laughs> we had a question from the audience. They enjoyed this look into his past life. Do you have, or his early life, do you have any uh, ideas about writing another prequel set when Quark was a child? Nope. Nope, that's it, one and done, okay. Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Do we get a teaser about what the next book holds for Cork at all? Um, I, what the next book holds is more important for Henry Malou mm -hmm. than for Cork. Uh, for readers of the series, uh, you know that the last book I put out was Desolation Mountain, and I left my my I left our favorite guy Henry Malou in kind of a precarious situation. Henry has seen his own death, um, and in the next book in the series, which will be out. A year from now, it'll be out in the fall of 2022. It will be called, I believe it's going to be called Anger Bay. We learn the fate of Henry Malou. Is there a real Anger Bay somewhere out there in the country? No, I made it up. Okay. <laughs> and we have a question about your next standalone novel. Are you ready to reveal anything about that? Only that it's a companion to both Ordinary Grace and This Tenderland. Companion in the like in that like ordinary grace in this tender land, it will take place in southern Minnesota, in the Minnesota River Valley around the town that I have created for for those stories, uh, New Bremen, and it will be set in an earlier time, and it will deal, I'm sure, with many of the same themes that ordinary grace and this tender land have dealt with. That's all I can reveal at the moment. Okay, I will be looking forward to all of those. I, I am so looking forward to writing this story, Pamela. I'm so stoked. And I am looking forward to reading it. I just, well, all of us, when the early copy of both Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land arrived, you know, there's practically an arm wrestling fight at the bookstore for who gets to read it first. So you better just send a case to each store for all the books. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions this evening for Kent? We have about, I think, 25 signed first editions remaining at the store. So don't dilly dally. You'll either want to copy and paste one of these links that I put in the chat box in there. If you want to look at the rest of Cork's work on the website, just click on his name and all the titles will come up so you can order the entire set if you are missing any of them. Um, don't forget Labor Day, you're gonna be exchanging gifts, makes a perfect time to give someone a signed first editions, birthdays, holidays, plan ahead. Buy them now for Christmas. Exactly. You know, there are supply chain disruptions. So get them while they're hot. <laughs> we have a question wondering about what authors you like to read for fun. For fun. Oh, you know, I wish I could say that I read for fun anymore, but I don't. <laughs> I read a lot for uh, the research that I do for my novels. Um, and while I enjoy it, it's not exactly fun. Uh, and I read what are called ARCs, Advanced Readers Copies. Uh, these are books that are going to be coming out many, many, many months from now. And I've been asked to read them for dust jacket quotes. And so while I enjoy it, I really am reading it for an entirely different uh, purpose. But if I ever have a chance to read for fun, um, I, you know, I pick up uh, whatever I can of my friends in the mystery business to see what they're up to these days. But very often, you know, if I'm reading, not reading a mystery, I read Midwest novelists. Um, Pamela, I think a case can be made that there's a Midwest voice in literature. It's a very spare voice, but very eloquent and rises significantly out of our relationship with this the, the land that we occupy here. I love stories that are set in the heartland and that feature the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So uh, Marilyn Robinson, her novel Gilead is one of my all time favorites. I love John Hassler's work, our own John Hassler. Um, you know, if you're looking for poets, Ted Kuzer is a wonderful poet out of Nebraska. So these are some of the people that I read. Right. I know we've got all these younger up and coming authors like Peter Guy and Mindy Mejia who- Oh, here in the Min Minnesota, we're just, it's a wealth of, of fine novelists. It is. I do have to ask you, I saw at the end of your New York Times interview, it asked you what you had on your nightstand. You said you don't read in bed, but that you were planning to read the book Woman with Troublesome Creek for your church book club. Did you get a chance to read it? I haven't yet. Uh, we have to discuss first um, a book called uh, Jim Henson, The Biography. 
Uh, that's our first book. And then I'll read the troublesome, the, the book woman of troublesome, Creek, which I'm looking love it, forward I think to. You have a great yeah. affection for libraries. Yeah, great. I'm yes. looking forward to that. You will really like it. Kim Michelle Richardson did a beautiful job and she's got a sequel coming out to that one. So hopefully it'll whet your appetite for that as well. <laughs> oh, I have to, I have to throw out one name. Yes, please do. You ask me who's sort of my favorite author these days. I would have to say it's Frederick Bachman who uh, wrote A Man Called Ove, um, um, his most recent novel, Anxious People. Any, I'll read anything that Frederick Buckman writes. He is a fabulous writer. And of course, he loves coming to Minnesota because we have so many people of Swedish ancestry here. We've had the pleasure of hosting him a couple times and always a treat. Yes, I agree with you. Excellent recommendations. Have you read My Grandmother Said to Tell You? I did. I loved it. I, said, I was just swept away by that, all the fairy tale lore mm -hmm. and um, the mm -hmm. child's narrative voice beautifully done <laughs> and it he's such a compassionate writer i just love his how how loving he is toward human beings yes exactly great recommendation all right we are coming to the conclusion of our time here on zoom Kent, I cannot thank you enough for so generously joining us this evening i know it's been a treat for our viewers um, I did want to give a shout out to a couple of things that Valley Bookseller has coming up. We have got a busy September here on Zoom. And on September the 8th, you can join us for Paula Hawkins. Some of you might remember her from a little book that did rather well called The Girl on a Train. She has a new one called A Slow Fire Burning. And she's going to be in conversation with fellow suspense novelist Laura McHugh. And they will be on Zoom. Tickets are available on the Valley Bookseller website. You can get a signed first edition when you get your ticket for the event. And then on September 14th, we are presenting the Book Club of Bay along with Skylark Books down in Missouri. And this is going to showcase 32 authors. I know, so you can watch it live with your tickets. You will also get a recording so you can go back and take that in a little more slowly because it's going to be rapid fire fun. So again, head over to valleybookseller.com. That will give you information about our upcoming events. And it will also let you pop right onto Kent Kruger's page and pick Lightning Strike or any of his other novels that you would like to order for yourself, for friends, for family. With the holidays coming up at my house, I like to do a book on a bed. So everybody either goes to bed or wakes up with something new to read. So what a great way to stock up. Do all your shopping at Valley Bookseller. I know we have wonderful staff members who would be more than happy to help you. And I do want to give a shout out to my fellow team members at Valley Bookseller, especially Lynn Murphy. Lynn is a huge Cork O'Connor fan and her expertise was of a huge help to me tonight in prepping for this event with Kate, with Kent. So thank you to Lynn out there. And of course, thank you so much to William Kent Kruger. I know you have many, many fans and it was a treat to get to bring you into their homes tonight with Zoom. Well, I always love talking with you, Pamela, and thanks to everybody who joined us this evening. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Keep reading. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend and lightning strike. Let's get it on the number one bestseller list this week. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Kent. <laughs>